Hello everyone and welcome to the Chef's Table series. My name is Carol O'Connor, co-host of this instructional cooking show. Today we are filming at the Sons of Italy Lodge and we are featuring Chef Joe Murphy, co-host of the show, as well as the president of the lodge, Terry Curran. They will be preparing three Italian dishes. The first dish is mozzarella and tomato with chiffonade basil topped with balsamic vinegar. Then they're going to make a chicken florentine which is a stuffed roasted chicken with prosciutto, spinach, and especially provolone topped with capers. And next, they'll be making a pasta dish, imported fresh fusilli pasta in a lemon sage sauce with sprinkled peas. And I love peas in my pasta. So let's bring Terry and Joe over to this table to learn how to make this dish. Hi, I'm Chef Joe Murphy, and today we're shooting at the Sons of Italy Lodge. And is it in Bologna, Italy? Where are we? Just, eat, just west of there, we're in Rosendale, Massachusetts. Great. This facility is a wonderful hall, and the members have been very considerate, along with Terry, who's the president, allowing us to maintain a studio so that we can shoot shows when we're not out on the road. So we are very grateful. And it's very important for us to tell you, the Chef's Table Foundation, the producer of the show, our ultimate mission is to raise money for homeless U.S. veterans and homeless teenagers, uh, 18 years of old with a high school or GED education. And the sad part is there's a thousand vets in this state and there are 6,000 documented teenagers homeless. And uh, co-host Carol O'Connor and I have been told that that's probably not even close for the kids because they go underground. It's probably three times that. So if you can imagine 16, 18,000 kids that are considered homeless, that does not necessarily mean they don't have a roof over their, uh, over their heads, but they do not have a permanent home in a family network. So this show also is encouraging the family to reinstitute or at least have a family meal once a week. And we hope that you get the recipe on our website. You can rewatch the show and cook along with the chef of the week. So today, again, it's sort of uh, a new thing for us. We did this once before. We have Terry Curran. She loves to cook. She's a true foodie. And I've actually had, she cooks for friends, people at the lodge. And I've had her food, and it's, uh, it's okay. <laughs> and no, I'm just kidding. Edible? It's, it's very good, very good. And you know, even your top chefs, there's always something new happening. You know, you have your basics, your saute, your roasting, your grilling, your poaching. So, you know, these are just your, your baseline techniques for preparing food. But, you know, there's always something new to learn. And we've had so many chefs, I've learned so much myself by just being with them and talking to them while they're doing the cooking. So, Terry, what are we making today? Well, perhaps you'll learn something today, Joe. Yeah, well, we'll see what happens. I hope so. I hope so. We're gonna start with a tomato and mozzarella salad with a chiffonata basil, mm -hmm. drizzle some EVOO and balsamic vinegar on it. Excellent. Our protein is going to be a stuffed chicken breast, and we've got some uh, provolone and uh, prosciutto and spinach going in there. Right. And then we have our fresh pasta right. that we're going to have with a lemon cream sauce with some peas in there. Right. Yeah, it's actually, uh, the sauce is, we're going to do a drizzle of a cream sauce over the chicken, just a, just a little bit of drizzle, and that's going to be a mushroom uh, so, uh, mushroom and cream sauce with a white wine reduction. And I think it's important to know that uh, we have a very good connection with a fellow who's been on the show a number of times, 
and we are cooking a semi-fresh uh, fusilli from Italy. It's an imported uh, product, and it's absolutely wonderful. And semi-fresh, it comes, it's a refrigerated item, and you could probably find it in specialty stores or specialty departments. So uh, there's a big difference between that and some of your store brands because it is an imported product. And we know the Italians make the best. So, all right, the first thing we're going to do then is why don't we, we start off with the first thing that takes the longest to cook. So, Terry, uh, why don't you stuff that chicken breast, okay? And we'll just show them how we toothpick it. And this is something that's gonna be roasted in the oven, all right? So, if you wanna stuff that chicken breast, should we tell them about our mise en place today? See, I was, that was a test for you. You did a great job. <laughs> Actually, I forgot. <laughs> we always talk about mise en place. And mise en place is a French term. It means everything in its place. And it does some really key things for you in your cooking. Number one, you don't leave out an important ingredient, but it also makes the process go very smoothly, the cooking, and it makes it far more enjoyable, okay? Because you're not running to look for a season or an herb or whatever in the cabinet. So why don't you tell them what we're gonna do first. Uh, what would you like to do? Um, we are gonna stuff the chicken and all of this mise en place is for the sauce that we're gonna put underneath the chicken, uh, okay. around the chicken. Why don't you Correct? tell them what we have here for ingredients? So we have butter. What kind of butter? Unsalted butter. Right, we always use unsalted butter. So we can control the salt. That's correct. We have some garlic here. Yeah. We have some nice whole ground pepper. We have kosher salt. Right. We always like kosher salt or sea salt for cooking. We've got some shallots down here. We're using Wondra today as our flour thickening agent. Right. We have some capers we're going to throw in because we love the salty taste. Right. A little bit of white wine. We're using cremini mushrooms today, but you can use your favorite. Right. We have some olive oil. This is some light cream and some chicken base. Great. And yeah, Terry gave you an appointment tip then. You know, everything should be to taste. You are the chef at home. So if there's a particular ingredient you don't want to use, that's your choice. You, nothing is exact. The only thing that's exact is in baking, okay? And that's hum as opposed to when you're scaling, it's more scientific than actually cooking because you can always add more salt or leave salt out. It's up to you. But I should tell you, our chicken stock, okay, is a store-bought stock and it's sodium free, all right? And the butter, as Terry mentioned, is unsalted. So we really only have, as far as salted, are your capers, all right? But in the chicken, you have the provolone cheese and you have the prosciutto. So think that through as you are cooking before you start adding a lot of extra salt or, you know, in, if you have a restriction, keep that in mind. So why don't you show them how to stuff this chicken, which is very simple. If you buy the uh, boneless breast, you turn it over, all right, and it's almost like a pocket. There you go. We're going to cut a pocket into it, yep. Okay. And we mixed uh, the, the, uh, spinach. the spinach provolone and parma prosciutto. Excellent. Get a good thick, you know, toothpick so that it won't break. Okay, just while our pans are heating up, it, it's your choice depending on what you have. Today, your, most of your ovens have an, a second option. So it's either convection or radiant heat. And either one is fine, you know, but I find the convections cook much quicker, all right? And I generally like to go the old method with the radiant heat. So, uh, but again, it, it's up to you. E either way is fine. Do not microwave, okay? It would just make your chicken tough, and I, I just don't like the way it cooks. So, as our pans come up to heat, okay, we're gonna take a little bit of olive oil. In both? Yeah. Eep, that's it. Good, that's enough. Excellent. 
So, you know, as you're cook if you're going to do a, a for four, let's say, you know, uh, these pans here are coated pans, so, you know, that reduces the sticking. And so just keep that in mind, you know, a tablespoon, ta two tablespoons, plenty. And that's pretty much what Chef Terry just put in here, so, which is good. Now, as soon as this oil heats up a little bit, which will probably take uh, about 15 more seconds, we're going to add the shallot and the garlic to both. Now, keep in mind, when you're doing garlic, do not walk away, all right? Because we did a very fine dice of garlic. I like to do it that way because it, I find it tends to blend in and you're not biting big chunks, okay? So, use it sparingly. That's Just the shallots? Yes, so I would use half of that, okay? Yeah, a little bit more, okay? You could do the same over here. Now, shallot looks like, a l when you peel it, it looks like a little onion. And it really is a great flavor enhancer. And this is what it looks like, okay? And it's like an onion. So cut through the root and then peel it. And then you can slice down and then slice across and get a fine dice. Okay. Now, why don't we add your... A uh, little bit of garlic. A little bit of garlic. We add a little more. Okay. Excellent. Waste not, want not, so you there know. There you go. There you okay. Go. Now you can hear these pans hopefully coming up. They're starting to sizzle, which is what we want. And uh, th this is a wonderful stove top uh, that we're using. And we try to use electric because we don't have uh, a hood. We don't want an open flame. And this was donated by two wonderful people. And it's a GE, uh, I believe, profile, but it mm -hmm. really works great. I generally use gas, but I've used electric uh, quite a bit. We don't want that burning. No, no. So, you know, if you see this getting too hot, all you have to do really is don't panic. Keep your eye on it. Just move it off the burner. Let the heat reduce a little bit in that pan, all right? Now. We want to let this go. When we start seeing a little bit of golden color on that garlic, that's time to add your liquid, okay? Because it gets very bitter. It will ruin the whole dish, all right? Now, what we're going to do here is, uh, it looks like the one for the... Uh, pasta. The pasta, which is a, it's a lemon, it's a lemon sauce, okay? A sage lemon sauce with a little bit of unsalted butter and, uh, you know, again, season to taste. So uh, we're going to use a chicken stock base, and we want that to reduce down. Now, if you're going to use the store-bought stocks, which I have no problem with personally, I, if I'm using it, I take one of those aseptic containers, and I will reduce one container by a third, at least a third. What is that going to do? It's going to increase the flavor of that stock. So then you can add the other stock. You're just going to get a much better flavor profile. You're okay. both ready. All right. Now, if you want... Uh, Little stock in both? Yes, Teresa of the Lodge. Uh, but, yeah, this one you can. Okay. That's good. Okay. So we're going to let this reduce a little bit. Now, as this here is cooking, all right, let's do the mushrooms. Okay. And you can turn this burner up just a tad, okay? Now, keep one thing in mind. When you're doing sautéing mushrooms, don't go crazy turning them over. Let them sizzle. Let them get a little crispy, at least on one side, because they are cooking through, okay? Tom? And again, that, that will give you a little caramelization, which will add flavor to the final uh, dish. And also, uh, when we're done, what we're going to do is we're going to deglaze the pan with a little bit of white wine. And we'll do, cook that down, right? Correct, yep. And just get rid of the alcohol. So if you do have an alcohol aversion and you know, you're afraid to use wine, Use your own judgment. You are cooking off the alcohol, so that should not affect you. 
Now, you can see this here, okay, is cooking a little too fast, all right? So what we're gonna do is just take it off the burner and I would add a little bit more stock to that. That's really cooking fast over there. Yeah, that's what I want. I want to get this good and crispy, all right? Then we're gonna take the white wine and we're gonna deglaze it, all right? We're not gonna do it yet, not yet, because these aren't cooked yet. We want them to get a little bit crispy. All right, you can turn that down a little bit. All right, you can see this little bit of smoke. You know, start using your judgment. Uh, if you see that smoking, that's too hot, really. Okay, so we're gonna just, we've set both of them off the burners for a minute. And don't put the handle over the burner because when you go back and grab it, you'll get a good Very burn. Warm. And you know, I have an old friend here, when I had a bakery, uh, he was one of the founders of a very well-known bakery named Bacchetto's Bakery. Obviously, the Italians would say Baschetto. And uh, there's nothing worse than taking out uh, large uh, sheep hands and not realizing they just came out of the oven and grabbed that pan <laughs> because you handle fuse right to that pan. And uh, because of the... The, the way the heat's conducted in the aluminum. So anyways, having said that, as I just said, you don't want to burn your hands, all right? Now, uh, what I want to do here is, Ed, let's, why don't we, okay, we can deglaze this. We're going to get this good and hot again. Wait, just let it come up, because we want that to go. Now, if you're using an open flame, just keep in mind, we're pouring wine in, you don't want that alcohol to, to hit the burner and then flare up, okay? So a good technique is just take that off, put it right in. Okay. Now we're going to cook the alcohol off of this. Chef, why don't we have a glass of wine for us here? Well, because you're working and you're not drinking on my job. Okay. Okay. Now, as this is cooking, I generally, just because I've done so much cooking with wine, you can tell when the alcohol's gone for the most part if you have an aversion. But you're actually not only cooking off the alcohol, but you're doing a reduction, which is what you want to do, okay? So we'll let that go for a minute. Now we're going to bring this back over here and let this reduce a little bit more, okay? And then we're going to add our sage in there. Okay, add your sage in there. Chef, how come we're using whole leaves of sage? Because uh, I don't like to tear this or cut this, and I just think it's, it's, it almost has the look of basil. And when it cooks down, you're going to get all the natural oils and flavors. You could certainly do it that way, but I always just throw the whole leaf in, okay? Now, this is cooking down pretty well. Okay, so what we want to do here is, let's get our capers. All right, we're going to put a few capers in. Again, a lot of sodium, but it's up to you. I love capers. I give them a little squeeze to get that excess brine out, okay? But this, to me, really adds to a, a, a great sauce. All right, now, do you have a little heavy cream? I do. N now again, this we're doing two sauces here. One, the sauce is to drizzle on your chicken, okay? And we just want to get enough in there, all right? And what happens here is you will get a little bit of color. Now see, normally, depending on how much you use, you could actually, as, as your uh, light cream cooks down, it, it actually thickens. Uh, we did a sauce, a large sauce earlier, but we added some thickener, which was the Wonder Flour, okay? Yep. But this you really don't have to. And again, this, you're not going to douse the chicken with this. You just want to give it a little bit of a drizzle, maybe a tablespoon, and make sure you get some mushrooms and the capers and then the juice. So for, for now, what we're going to do is just take this off the burner, all right? You could turn that burner off, Chef this front burner, our rear burner, okay.
than this one here, all right? Now, why don't we add a little bit of salt to this? Now, this doesn't have capers in it, okay? So what we're gonna do here is we want that salt, a little bit of pepper, and... Lemon. You can add your lemon juice. Now, you could use... Uh, fresh squeezed lemon. Fresh squeezed lemon. You could use, you know, the bottled lemon. If you like lemon cella, again, just cook off the alcohol. And a lot of times in a really good restaurant, they're using a lemon cello, okay? So we're gonna let that cook down a little bit more. We can bring that up more to a roll. And I'll tell you, the aromas are coming up. And again, think about the lemon, how much you wanna use. It, again, it's to taste. And then you can have your tasting spoon. Check the seasoning, see what you think. And then if it needs more, Look at more salt. Okay. Excellent. Now, one thing we didn't do with the white sauce, we are gonna do it with this sauce also. Unsalted butter, again, adds another layer of flavor, all right? But it does another thing. It gives your finished sauce a shine, which is what you, you like to see on the plate, because it really pops. And remember, as we're eating with, you know, we're eating with our eyes first. So why don't you give me a pat of that butter, okay? And then you can mix that in this sauce here, all right? Sure. And then uh, we're gonna let that melt in, and then I want you to taste this. Now remember, would you taste this after you salt it or before? That's all right, I, that's fine. That one's off. No, I know, but it still has the uh, residual heat. It's melting. Okay. I and you taste it before you salt it so that you know if you need to add any salt or not. Right. And keep one thing in mind. There's something very salty already the in there. The capers in there are very, very salty. Very good. Okay. Why don't you get a taste and see if you think it's salty enough. We didn't put any pepper in, but let's... Uh, we can add a little pepper if it needs it. It actually needs salt. Okay. There you go. Okay, and don't forget. Do you want a little pepper? Yeah, I put a little pepper in here. Don't go crazy with the salt. You can always keep adding it as you need it, all right? And we will do that just before we serve it, all right? Now, let's go back over here, all right? And we're going to do, uh, when we put the pasta in here, we do not want this a real liquid. We want this to attach to the pasta, all right? And I would say this. If you ate pasta with nothing on it, you'd say, oh, this is terrible. But that sauce that's clinging, going into the pores, that's what really makes the pasta. It's just because you're not Italian, Joe. We don't have a problem eating pasta with nothing on it. Yeah, well, you'd be the first one. Okay, so, now, what we want to do here, okay, is let's get, we're going we're to use Wonder Flour. I like a cornstarch myself. And usually I'll do a ratio, tablespoon of cornstarch, tablespoon of water, and I put it in a jar and I shake it. So again, depending on how much you want, but we need the whisk so that it doesn't clump. Wonder flour is a great, also a great, uh, here you go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, and then, you know, it takes a minute, then you'll see how thick it is, all right? As it heats up and cooks and, and, and gets into the uh, your your base stock or your baked sauce, um, it will thicken. So don't and if you over thicken it and it becomes like paste or mud, then add a little bit more Chicken stock. Stuff. It's very simple. Okay, uh, yeah, that's still a little thin. Why don't we add a little bit more? Wonder flour. And again, have a whisk and keep it going. Yeah, okay, now that's really thickening up. So, and I'm almost hoping this gets too thick because if it does, 
then we, I'd like to show you what, you know, as you, Terry Absolutely. just said, add a little bit more chicken stock to it. It will be fine, okay? So, you know, it's getting to that thick stage, but we want it to go just a little bit more because we want it to really adhere to that pasta. And uh, you want to give it a taste, Chef? Don't you think it needs a little butter first? Yeah, if you think so. I do. Okay. Whisk away. Okay. And this really gives it that extra creamy taste, which I, I love. And, you know, as I've taken this off the burner, the sauce is still thickening. Okay, you see, it, it's got almost a little less than almost a pancake batter, which you don't really want it that thick, but okay. Why don't you give it a taste? Nice. Is it good? Okay. And I think this is thick enough, all right? And for the amount of pasta that we're going to be presenting, there's enough sauce here. You really just want to be able to coat the pasta. You don't want to drown it. You know, sometimes you go to a restaurant, the pub, and it comes out and it's swimming in sauce. To me, it's way overboard. And, uh, you know, I like to mix it in and just have a little bit extra on top, but that's me. Should we throw uh, some peas in there? Yes, you can. I want to turn this down a little. Wrong way. I'm sorry. All right, why don't you throw your peas in there? Now this dish here, just to give you uh, more of a vegetable, we decided to add some nice peas. And these are frozen peas. And I find you don't have to go crazy cooking them for a long period of time. I like a little bit of texture, okay? And uh, it makes a difference. I want to add just a little bit more stock to this, Chef, because it's still thickening. I didn't see Niagara Falls, Chef. That was whatever. a bit. Okay. You're doing a great job. Thank you, Chef. And I'm so glad you're here. You know, I generally, I've said this many times, cooking here with chefs, uh, the Irish monks went into Europe and they built their monasteries, they did farming, ag you know, with uh, beef, lamb, pigs, chickens. And they had an abundance. Because they did, they really developed some great cooking techniques. And they taught the Italians how to cook. Okay? Oh, smart. Oh, boy. Here we go. Are they, are they coming towards me? You bet. Um, well, I've actually had somebody yell, well, well St. Patrick was Italian. And I know he was. But you know what? When he came, the food was so good, he didn't want to leave. So we stayed there. So now that pea will give you a little bit more, a little sweeter flavor. Exactly. So does that have enough lemon juice flavor in it? Or we could take another taste. Plenty of lemon in it. Okay, great. Now what we're going to do is, we did pre -cook, cook the pasta. So I want to give you a little tip on the pasta. Just get it just before al dente, because we will finish the cooking in the sauce, okay? Now, if you decide to make that pasta a day before, and refrigerate it two days before, and for instance, if you do it on a Sunday, you want to serve a Tuesday night to have a nice dinner, that's acceptable. Do not put olive oil on it to separate so that uh, they don't stick together and clump. Use butter. I've done it with the olive oil, and one time, without even realizing it, taste the pasta, I said, oh, gee, this tastes funny. What happened? It gets a little rancid. So just use the butter, mix it in with your hot pasta, and then just, you, when it cools down enough, you can store it in the refrigerator, okay? So. Now, we've got your two sauces here, which is great. That's done. This chicken is roasting in the oven, and it smells fabulous. And it probably smells fabulous because Teresa of the Lodge put the stuffing in it in the toothpick. So I'm sure 
your touch Absolutely. made these aromas coming Absolutely. out, which we really, really love. Would you like me to grab it out of the oven? Yes, but I don't want you to burn yourself. So, why don't you take this, okay? Are you going to open the door for me? Yes, okay. There you go. You okay. <laughs> Fine. There we go. Okay. Now, we don't want to stick that right on a hot counter because it, there you go. Very okay. good. There we okay, go. Okay, so there's your, your finished chicken breast. And I'm sure everybody's cooked chicken, but you can really see how this is plumped up, okay? It's good and firm, so it should be really great. Now, on the pre-cooked pasta, okay, which is acceptable, we are going to reheat that in this sauce, the lemon sage sauce with peas, all right? So let's turn that burner on. Yep. What, what am I at there? You're at uh, medium. Okay. Ready? Yeah. Okay, and just let that go. And we'll give that a good toss. Why don't you do that, Chef? Okay, and then I want a little bit of chicken stock if there's any left. Certainly. Yeah, now this continued thickening, okay, because of the residual heat. So we're just going to loosen it up a little bit, all right? Do you want a little heat under there? Uh, no. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, yes, you could do that. And then if I can have that chicken breast. All right, now what you could do with this is turn that off and just let that stand for a minute, okay? Okay. It's not hot? Iron hands. Yeah. Mm. No, iron will. Okay, so, you know, I think the best, you could certainly put this on the plate, but I think it's nice to serve it, all right? It is a stuffed chicken cut it i don't know cut it as thick as you want i like just like a, a three eighths okay and don't forget to take the toothpick out like i just forgot you don't want to be chewing on that it's sticking yourself which i just did okay okay can i have the plate chef let me stab myself there Okay. All right. I thought you were using. These are tongs right there. If that's what you're looking for. No. Okay. You want to decorate the plate so it looks nice. Now, chef, why don't you throw some fresh parsley in that sauce in with the pasta? And I see we have some Parmesan cheese. Is that going in the sauce or on top? Yeah, and do never Parmesan when it's steaming hot, okay? Because if you do, it's going to clump up. Okay, that's good. You can pour a little bit in and then mix it. Now, again, here's another tip on your sodium. If you find that that sauce needs a little bit more salt, just remember you've got uh, the, the Parmesan cheese maniac here just... Oh, I, that wasn't very nice. I'm sorry. You have the Parmesan cheese lady doing her thing. That was a, a light drizzle of Parmesan. I see. See, you don't understand because you're not Italian. That's all right. They'll tell you that was just a light drizzle of okay. Parmesan. Now, if you want to take, if you, if you want me to take that, and then you want to put together the uh, tomato salad. Sure. Okay and show them how you're going to do that. And Absolutely. I'll get the plate set. That. OK, now that's that. All right, Chef, let's do this. Now, if you wouldn't mind, put some, yeah. There we go. No, sorry, Chef. Let me, is that it? Yep. OK, just to give it a little bit more color. And this your cheese? That's the cheese. Okay. Go light on it, don't you know, go too heavy. I seasoned it. Yeah, I know. Okay, and she did a great job. And so, and you know, you could see the stuffing here, and it is stuffed. This wasn't rolled, so you weren't doing a lot of butterfly work. And it's a stuff, so you have spinach, the cheese, the prosciutto. It's great for a crowd chef. You can just stuff them all, stick right, them in the oven, right. get them ready, prepped, and exactly. 45 minutes in the right. oven, and they're done. Okay, uh, chef, why don't you come over this side here? And then you can do your, uh, do your tomato. I just want to clean up your board a little bit. Thank for you. you. Boy, 
You're going to trust me with your special knives? Yes. All righty. Go ahead. Do your thing. So now, we yeah, go ahead. We picked up some beautiful tomatoes today. Yeah. So we're just going to use some nice, big, fat slices. And our good friend, Giuseppe, made us some mozzarella, some right. fresh mozzarella Do today. Have a plate for that, I don't have a plate. I was just going to put it together right there. Okay. So just to give it a little look, we're just going to slide it in between. Right. Now, um, what I want you to do is straight the up is the the basil. Basil. Yep. Yes, it is. Love basil. We all love basil. Okay. I love a really good uh, balsamic. Uh, if it's a very thin one, you could do a reduction on that. If you like, you'll get a, a you know more intensity and flavor, and it'll give it more of a syrupy. But if you want to just put a little bit on, and this is really just a drizzle. But before you do that, chef. I'd like you to put a little salt to taste, and then a little pepper to taste. Chef, why aren't we using white pepper so we don't see it? Why? Yeah. You know, the French use it. It's good in soups with cream sauces. I do not like white pepper. I use black pepper. Seeing the black specks makes me feel good. OK. You want to know you're eating pepper. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Let me give this a little drizzle with yeah, the balsamic. Yeah. And, and again, you know, it's two taste. Give it a little drizzle. You don't want to overwhelm the, the tomato in the mozzarella. You want a spoon, Chef? Um, no, I'm good. Okay. I'm just going to give it a little drizzle. Mm. Chef, you know, we got one thing here that uh, we didn't use yet. What was that? We have the sauce for the chicken. Yes, How do you're we want absolutely nap right. I am so sorry. That's okay. Let me get you a nice spoon. Yeah, you can use this. I got a clean one. All right. Just give that a little swirl first. Okay. Now again, our cream sauce, and it has the mushrooms, capers. So did we just want to nap this on the outside? Did we no, you hit? just. I would just give it a drizzle right down the middle. There you go. How does that look? It looks fabulous. Right. Looks edible. Yeah. Did you hear that? Yeah. Very good. That's a very high compliment coming from Italians. It's edible. Yeah. Well. The only thing better would have been if they said not bad. Yeah. Well, you know, generally when we have an audience, they uh, serve the meal that we produce, and as good as this dish looked, I could see them drooling putting their bibs on, but we don't have any food for them today. <laughs> Just kidding. You'll have Just a revolt kidding. on your hands. I know it. So one other thing I want to point out. When you take that chicken out of the oven, let it rest for six, seven minutes before you cut it. You want all the juices to be reabsorbed into the meat, and that will help keep your dish, uh, your, your protein, you know, tasty, not dry. But um, we hope that you enjoy uh, this dish. We'd like you to try it. And again, a special thanks to Terry Curran, president of the Sons of Italy Lodge on Birch Street in Roslindale, Massachusetts. It's our pleasure. Our Thank pleasure you. to be here with you. Right. And also, uh, the Chef's Table Foundation, again, is dedicated to supporting homeless veterans and homeless young adults that have a desire or a passion to be in the culinary arts. So you can go to the website and rewatch the show. You can get the recipe and cook with the chef of the week. Now, if you go to this show, my suggestion is listen to Joe. <laughs> Terry had a few very good tips, but listen to Joe. <laughs> So anyway, I'm only kidding. She, mm. she, she is a real foodie. She does a great job, and uh, we're, we're thrilled to have her on, on the show.
So, uh, again, on behalf of the Chef's Table Foundation, the Sons of Italy Lodge of Birch Street, Rosendale, Massachusetts, uh, we want to thank you for watching and enjoy. Manja, as we say. Bon appetito. Sure, whatever. <laughs> thank you. Hi, I'm Kelsey Roth. I um, do marketing communications for Craft Beer Cellar, and I'm also a certified Cicerone. Today's pairing, we're looking at uh, pairing a beer with um, some uh, pan-seared sea scallops and winter squash uh, ravioli. And those two dishes are going to have uh, a fair amount of richness to them. Uh, there's also some mushrooms in the dish, some shiitake mushrooms and some Parmesan cheese, which is going to add a little bit of like pepperiness, uh, some earthiness, or as we like to call umami flavors. Um, and there's a lot of complexity and a lot of flavors uh, coming out of in, in this dish. So we want something that can match that intensity, um, but can also, uh, it is not going to overpower the uh, delicate uh, scallops and the the nice flavors from the cheese. So what I chose here is a Belgian style saison, also called a farmhouse ale. And uh, the saison style is probably one of the no most nebulous of all beer styles in that the style originated from farmer brewers who were just brewing beer on the farm um, and they would often brew with just things that they had on hand. So. The beer traditionally would be brewed with all kinds of different herbs and spices and grains, um, brewed using different techniques. And um, so when commercial brewing started to take off, the style almost went extinct. And uh, we have Saison Dupont to thank for resurrecting the style and it's now kind of held up as the standard bearer for the style. But what really comes through on these beers is the yeast character. Uh, you're going to get some lemon and pepper notes from the yeast. This one in particular is a little bit stronger in alcohol than normal for, for a normal Saison. It's eight and a half. Um, but that extra sweetness, those extra sugars are going to help it to stand up against those mushrooms and that um, and the winter squash ravioli, the richness there, as well as the uh, pan seared scallops. Um, so when we pour beer, um, we want to kind of do it at a 45 degree angle. We want to make sure that we do get head on the beer. Um, that's always very important, but uh, we also want to make sure that um, it's done in a way that isn't agitating the beer too much. So I'm just going to do a small pour here. Um, and this beer in particular loves to have a beautiful, big, thick, fluffy head. Um, there's a lot of carbonation in here, um, which means that it's well attenuated. There's one of those beer, beer geeky words. Um, but the, uh, that just basically just means the yeast is doing its job very well. Um, it's a hard worker. Um, but this beer is going to have a little bit of tropical fruit flavors from the Amarillo hops. Um, that's going to go just kind of work really nicely with those dried cranberries and, um, you know, help bring out some of the fruit flavors in the squash. But the, the, the residual sweetness there from the higher alcohol um, really makes this a, 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 a beer that can stand on its own. Um, the kind of farmhouse flavors that we're getting in here from the yeast also are going to match really nicely with the, uh, the earthy flavors of the mushrooms as well as the truffle oil and things like that that are in the dish. Um, so, uh, so this is a great beer to check out. Uh, we like to say in the beer industry, when you're pairing beer with food, when in doubt, Saison. Um, it's uh, one of those beers that goes great with almost any kind of food. Um, so when in doubt, Saison. I'm Kelsey Roth with Craft Beer Cellar, and we're a proud supporter of the Chef's Table Foundation. Hello everyone, my name is Carol O'Connor and welcome to our new segment, Farm to Table. I am here with Steve Verrill, he's the partner here of Verrill Farms in Concord. So today we're going to talk about lettuce. So Steve, thanks for, for being on the segment yeah, here with pleasure. me today. Tell us what we're going to learn about lettuce, because you have all different types I see. Well, we do a lot of things. Actually, uh, it's great this time of year because we have the nice fresh 
uh, tender lettuce that's grown in this area. You can get it maybe out of your home garden or else at your nearest uh, farm stand or farmer's market. Mm -hmm. uh, but the varieties are usually more the leaf and bib type oh, okay. here. And uh, we'll get into that more in a minute, but I'd like to talk a little about how we grow our lettuce. Uh, we start all of our lettuce in uh, plug trays. You pass mm -hmm. me a sure. tray here? Oh, I see. These are the, the plug trays we use to start each seedling. Uh, we fill these with a potting soil, 128 plugs in a tray. We put one seed in each plug and uh, start it. And uh, we grow the plants in this for about three and a half to four weeks. And then uh, we'll put them out in the field mm -hmm. in another uh, about three weeks. So six or seven weeks from the seed till uh, in a nice plug uh, oh. like this. Oh, I see. All ready to go out in the field. And uh, they're very nicely rooted, and we can pull this out of the tray quite easily. And we have a mechanical planter that people ride by hand. We just drop that in, and it goes down. They get planted exactly 12 inches apart. We put three rows in the bed. The rows are 20 inches apart. And by doing it this way, we can put an established plant in a, a weed-free bed, so we don't have to. Uh, sort through the little weeds to find the little lettuce plants like you might in your home garden at home. <laughs> right. Because we have this all started and then it's easy to cultivate it. Oh wow, I can't believe that little thing becomes like these big bushels. It's only, only three or four weeks away. Wow. There are a lot of local varieties of leaf and bib type lettuces mm -hmm. that uh, are grown locally more. Iceberg actually doesn't do very well in the heat we have here in the summer. Uh, but the leaf lettuces do better. Mm -hmm. You do have to be careful though, I didn't mention when we're uh, doing the seeding, the seeds don't germinate well at the temperature, the soil is over uh, 75 degrees. So wow. in those cases we'll put it up in the barn cellar or <laughs> occasionally we even put the trays in the refrigerator before we uh, start to get mm -hmm. it cooled down. Then after they sprout in two days or so, uh, it's fine to take the sun and the heat then. But, Perfect. Uh, the Boston is probably one of the most common mm -hmm. lettuce people think about around here. And uh, this is a very nice head of a Boston mm -hmm. lettuce. Uh, he calls so can uh, have a red Boston, it would be this one. Oh, I didn't know there was a, such a thing as red Boston. Yeah. Oh. Uh, they're both very tender and uh, nice eating. Right. Then some of the others, uh, uh, this is a red summer crisp. And this is very yeah. tasty, but it's a little thicker, a little mm -hmm. heavier leaf than the Boston's are. Mm -hmm. And then you can go on to a green summer crisp, the same thing. It's a little thicker leaf, but they all are very tender still. And then if you want to add a little different texture, some of the leaf, other leaves are a little crinkly. And mm -hmm. uh, these are just half a dozen of many varieties wow. to choose from. I didn't know there was that many. Yeah, and if you... Uh, Pick it out of your garden or get it home from the market mm -hmm. uh, and you're not going to eat it today. You you might want to uh, uh, rinse it in water and dunk it a little bit yes. and then either shake it out or take it apart. Actually it's best if you break it open I think, separate the leaves and uh, either put it in a spinner or uh, shake them dry and put them in a plastic bag with a mm -hmm. or a towel, wrap them in a, a dish towel right. works fine or a paper towel in a plastic bag, something to keep the humidity as near 100% as possible, but not having the leaves in the touching standing water. Mm -hmm. They'll turn color then and spoil. And the temperature is near freezing as you can. Oh, how long would that last in the refrigerator with the paper towel in the plastic bag? How long, like a day or two? Well, until you're going to eat them, but yeah. But you should eat it within two yeah, days? Yeah, yeah, if you probably, depending on the lettuce and how fresh it was when you got it, but okay. you could probably go three or four days that oh, okay. way without any trouble. Ooh. Yeah. This is great. I like how, because this would be such a great salad. They have all different types of lettuce and, you know, then the fixings. Well, they, they <gasps> just break apart and it's some nice, nice leaves. Can I eat it? Mm. Oh, my God. Too bad Joe doesn't like lettuce, kidding. And these are still, <laughs> these are nice and sweet as the plant matures more, it gets mm. uh, uh, bitter a little bit. Mm -hmm. mm. These are good. Excuse me for my mouthful. 
But another thing in the home garden that's a little different, uh, mm -hmm. people might see the plants thicker in the home garden and when it comes up thick and small you could thin it out and get some microgreens or uh, mescaline mix out of it with the smaller ones and then as they get bigger just leave one every foot or so. Mm -hmm. And then on that in the home garden you could start picking the outside leaves off first and eat them and some oh, more it'll grow a little more. That's a good but idea. If you go too long on that it will get bitter so yes. you still have to do some more planting. Don't mm -hmm. try to stick to one. <laughs> just keep going. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow Steve this was so interesting. I oh. think it's great how it starts out little, a little seed yeah. in these, um, what do you call them again? The black the um, plugs. The plug plugs, trait, and yeah. they burst into a big, you know, bushel <laughs> of lettuce. Great. Well, it's so amazing because uh, when you look at a seed, <laughs> it's not very big. Right. And I'm sure. the genes will do all these different things depending on what's in the seed. And it's always been amazing to me. You can take a, a pot of soil. And the same soil, you can either grow a nice sweet strawberry or you can <laughs> grow a hot pepper in it. It's wow. all just a little programming that's in the seeds mm -hmm. to start with. That's so interesting. It's like there's a science when it comes to planting. Well, uh, kind of. plant Wait. breeding is, of course, that's been going on for Many. centuries. Right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And uh, it's getting a little more sophisticated now and a little. Uh, debatable if you go to the extent of GMOs. That's a whole other subject we won't get into yeah, here. Yeah, we can talk about that next time. <laughs> so much to learn here. So Steve, thank you so much for talking to us about the lettuce. Yeah, you're I welcome. can't I can't wait to have the salad with it. <laughs> okay. So um, we'll see you the next Enjoy. time. Okay, thank you. I'm Steve Verrill of Verrill Farm in Concord on behalf of the Chef's Table Foundation.